Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's uh, biophysics seminar uh, tutorial and talk by David Santian. It's my honor to introduce him. Um, he will start with a tutorial um, on the rheology of active fluids, and uh, afterwards we'll give a talk. Uh, David, you can start. All right. <clears throat> Thank you, Kayla, for uh, the introduction and for the opportunity to uh, speak in this uh, seminar series. Um, so as Kayla mentioned in the first half hour, I'll give you a tutorial on the rheology of active fluids, and then uh, in the second half hour, I'll, I'll talk about something different. <clears throat> so the rheology of active fluids is a, a topic that I've been interested in for a number of years. And so my uh, tutorial is going to be a little bit partial. I'm, I'm going to show a lot of my own take on this on the topic, but of course uh, there's other uh, other groups that have worked on this. And so if you want maybe a more broad uh, view of the topic, I encourage you to read this annual review of fluid mechanics that I wrote a few years ago that uh, has more references and maybe a more ex exhaustive uh, review of the field. Um, so we're talking about active fluids. Uh, so a little bit of a background. Um, so I, I think this audience probably is familiar with active matter, but uh, just to remind you, we're thinking about uh, collections of particles or macromolecules that uh, are able to draw energy from uh, a source of fuel, either internal or from their environment, and convert this into uh, mechanical work. Um, so there are many examples in biology as well as in engineering, and I'm just showing a few pretty images here in the bottom to, uh, to, to show some of them. And um, the one example that I'm mostly going to be thinking about in, in this uh, tutorial is a suspension of swimming particles, such as bacteria, for instance, uh, which is shown here in, in panel A. Um, some features of these systems that have um, excited a lot of interest over the last uh, couple of decades are that they tend to self-organize and they display collective motion, uh, strong fluctuations. But the one feature that I'm going to uh, focus on in this, uh, in this tutorial is their rheology. As it turns out they also exhibit a very unusual rheology, which is very unlike that of uh, passive uh, soft matter systems. Um, so I mentioned collective motion. I'm just going to show a few movies to illustrate what I mean here. Uh, these are uh, beautiful movies of uh, active matter systems that are flowing spontaneously. Uh, so the left, the left two movies show collections of uh, biological polymers that are acted upon by molecular motors. Uh, the top right shows a suspension of swimming bacteria, and the bottom line, right is a, is a synthetic system that shows colloidal rollers. <clears throat> so there's been a lot of work trying to look, to trying to understand the origin of these collective motions. Um, that's not what I'm going to focus on here. Uh, I'm going to focus on the rheology that I'll try to show you near the end of my talk that there's a connection between the rheology and these uh, motions that we're seeing in these movies. Um, so a brief review of rheology, uh, especially for the students in the audience, right? So this is uh, undergraduate fluid mechanics. If you think of uh, having a fluid and you shear it so between two plates, uh, you create a simple shear flow with a linear velocity profile. Um, that uh, increases with y linearly with a constant proportionality, which is a shear rate gamma dot, which is the one of the components of the velocity gradient. Now, if you perform this experiment with a Newtonian fluid, such as water or oil, what you find is that the shear stress, which is the force per unit area that you have to exert to, to deform the system, is proportional to the shear rate. And the constant of proportionality, of course, is the shear viscosity mu. And this is a, a special case of this more general constitutive relation, which is shown here, which is the, the constitutive relation for the stress in a, an incompressible Newtonian fluid that shows that the stress depends linearly on the rate of strain tensor. Now, as we all know, not all fluids are Newtonians, and so there are many examples of fluids that don't uh, follow this uh, linear relation. And so any, any, non any fluid that has a nonlinear relation between shear stress and rate of strain is going to be called non-Newtonian. Uh, and these are some, some classic behaviors that, uh, that are common in, in, uh, in passive uh, uh, non-Newtonian fluids. And in all these cases, these nonlinearities come from microstructural rearrangements. The fact that these fluids contain particles or macromolecules that when you share the system are going to reorganize. They're going to stretch, they're going to align, they're going to jam. And this is what gives rise to these changes in the, in the viscosity with a uh, shear rate. So, um, this is essentially what we want to study, but now we're going to focus on active fluids. So what does active uh, fluid rheology look like? Uh, so let's look at some experiments. Uh, so this is a pretty busy slide, so let me walk you through it. Um, so there's been a, quite a few attempts over the last uh, decade or so at measuring the rheological behavior of suspensions of swimming particles. And so I'm showing three different experiments corresponding to the three columns in this figure. 
the first two experiments were done using suspensions of E. coli, which is a bacterium, and the third column was performed with suspensions of Chlamydomonas, which is a microalgae. And they use different techniques. So the first column used a microfluidic rheometer, and the next two columns uh, used a Taylor Poet rheometer. So let me uh, describe the results. So let's focus on the first column first here. Uh, that used a microfluidic rheometer. So this is what the, the, rheome the rheometer looks like. It's got this, uh, these two inlets. Um, one inlet is flowing a bacterial suspension. The other one is flowing uh, clear fluid, suspending fluid. And these two streams of fluids meet in this main channel. And by measuring the position of the interface between these two fluids, you can actually back out the viscosity of the bacterial suspension. Essentially, if you inject the same flow rate, uh, if one fluid is more viscous, it's going to, uh, to end up deflecting uh, the interface. So this is what they measured. So they measured uh, here a relative viscosity, which is a viscosity of the bacterial suspension divided by the viscosity of the solvent as a function of shear rate. <clears throat> and they performed two sets of experiments, one with non-motile cells that don't swim and one with motile cells that, that do swim. And the behavior is quite different. In the case of non-motile cells, you find that the viscosity is nearly constant. It shear thins a little bit, so it decreases the shear rate. And it's above one, meaning that uh, suspension of non-motile cells is more viscous than clear fluid. Um, the motile suspensions, however, behave, be, uh, behaves very differently. And what you find in particular is that you have a, a viscosity which is below one at low shear rates, then shear thickens, and then shear thins. So this is a behavior that we're going to try to explain in, in, the, rest, in the rest of the talk. Uh, let me right away emphasize that this viscosity below one here is very surprising. So uh, what this means is that you take water, you add bacteria to it, and you shear the system, and you measure a viscosity which is less than that of water. Um, that's very unusual. Uh, typically, when you add particles to fluids, the fluids thicken and, and become more, more viscous, right? So active fluids are one example where this uh, doesn't necessarily happen. And we'll, We'll understand why in the next few slides. Um, the second column shows uh, an experiment on the same system, E. coli again using this stellar quite rheometer, and you get these kind of curves that look very similar with a viscosity which is less than one at low shear rates, shear thickens, and then shear thins again at high shear rates, so same kind of curves. Um, what they did in, experiment, in this experiment also was very systematically the density of bacteria. And this is highlighted in this bottom plot that shows the value of this low shear plateau as a function of density. And what you find is that when you increase the density of bacteria, the viscosity decreases, decreases until it apparently reaches zero. And this is, again, very surprising. So you have a, a, a suspension of bacteria, and you shear it, and you measure a viscosity, which is apparently zero. And so that's something that we're going to try to explain again. And um, finally, the last column shows an experiment on uh, Chlamydomonas, and uh, let's focus on the bottom plot here that shows the, the relative viscosity minus one as a function of density. And what you find in this case is that um, the swimming cells actually give rise to a higher viscosity than the dead cells, uh, which seems to contradict uh, the two previous experiments on E. coli. So in the case of E. coli, we find a decrease in viscosity, at least at low shear rates. In the case of Chlamydomonas, there appears to be an increase in viscosity as a result of activity. So these are uh, trends that we'd like to, uh, to explain. Um, so if we want to, to understand these trends, we need to understand a little bit the hydrodynamics of these, uh, these microswimmers. Uh, so I'm going to say a few words about E. coli and Chlamydomonas and des describe the flow fields that they create when they swim. So here's a, a summary of the hydrodynamics of E. coli. So this is what E. coli looks like. It's got this rod-shaped uh, body uh, and these flagella that form this thick bundle, which rotates like a micropropeller and ends up propelling the cell. Um, so here's a cartoon of E. coli. Um, as the, as the uh, bundle rotates, it exerts a thrust on the fluid, which I'm calling FP here for propulsive force, if you'd like. And this is what pushes the cell towards the right in this picture. And as the cell moves uh, through a viscous fluid, there's going to be a viscous force on the cell body, which I'm calling FD here for drag force, which exactly balances the thrust by the flagella. Uh, so if you want to idealize this, this bacterium in terms of forces, you can think of it as exerting these two equal and opposite forces on the fluid as it swims. And two equal and opposite forces, it's a dipole. 
And in Stokes flow, you can calculate the flow field induced by a dipole. This is uh, the expression that you get for a symmetric dipole. And it's got one coefficient sigma naught here, which is a dipole strength, uh, sometimes called the stresslet. We'll come back to this, which is really the, the, the only coefficient that you have to determine to understand the flow field induced by these, uh, by these swimmers, at least uh, in the far field. So how good of a model is this? This is something that was uh, tested experimentally in this beautiful, beautiful paper by uh, Knud Drescher and co-workers where they did PIV, particle image velocimetry around individual bacteria. And they measured a flow field that looks like this, uh, which if you compare it to the theoretical flow field for a dipole, uh, actually it does quite a good job, especially far away from the bacterium. And you can be more quantitative. You can look at the decay of the velocity as a function of distance. And it goes like one over R squared, which is a signature of a dipole. So from this data, you can actually extract the dipole strength sigma naught, which has this value here. And it's negative, uh, which corresponds to a dipole which is extensile, meaning that the two forces point upward. And this is what we're going to call oops, a pusher. OK, so that's the, the basic picture for E. coli. We can do the same thing for Chlamydomonas. So Chlamydomonas uh, has this kind of a nearly spherical body, and it has two flagella that it uses to do some kind of breaststroke. And so um, similarly as for E. coli, you can think of these two flagella as exerting a propulsive force, which has to be balanced by the drag force on the cell body. So again, to leading order, we have a dipole, except that now the sign of the dipole is reversed. The forces are pointing inward instead of pointing outward. And this is, again, something that, that was measured experimentally in these experiments by Knud Drescher, uh, where they checked, indeed, that uh, in the far field, far enough away from the cell, the flow looks, looks like uh, the flow of a, of a dipole. And so this particle, which uh, has a contractile dipole, we're going to call it a puller because it pulls itself uh, through the fluid. So these are the basic flow fields that these particles uh, induce as they swim. So maybe from this, we can uh, gain some basic intuition as to what's happening to the rheology. And this is uh, what's, um, what's described here in the slide. Oops. So let's imagine we have a, a simple shear flow as shown here, and we're placing uh, some particles in this flow, and we'd like to understand what their effect is going to be on the flow. So let's first uh, focus on the case of a passive particle, like this rigid rod, let's say, that does not swim. <clears throat> if you have a passive Brownian rod in a shear flow, it's going to tend to, on average, adopt an orientation which is as shown in this picture, which is in the extensional quadrant of the flow, nearly aligned with the flow direction, but not quite. I'll come back to this in a, in a few slides. Now, with this orientation, um, the particle experiences extension from the flow. And because the particle is inextensible, it's going to resist that extension by uh, exerting a force dipole, which is uh, denoted by these two black arrows, which is contractile. And this induces a disturbance, which is shown by these purple arrows, which tends to resist the applied flow. And so this is why when you put rods in the fluid, you're going to measure a viscosity which is higher than that of a solvent. Now, what happens if you put active particles? If you put a pusher, this bacterium right here, it's also going to adopt an orientation which is as shown in the extensional quadrant. But now, in addition to this passive dipole due to inextensibility, there is also an active dipole shown by these blue arrows that corresponds to the swimming, which is a dipole that I talked about a couple of slides ago. And this dipole drives a flow, uh, which has the opposite sign as for the passive rod, and is going to tend to enhance the applied flow or facilitate the applied flow. And this is why we expect a decrease in the effective viscosity. Essentially, for the same shear rate, you don't need to apply as much stress because the particles are doing part of the work for you. Um, now, in the case of puller, same idea, except that the, the sign of the active dipole is reversed. Uh, so now this behaves more like a passive rod in the sense of that uh, the, the swimming dipole resists uh, the flow, the, resists the applied flow. And so this gives rise to uh, a, a, an increased viscosity, at least apparently. So that's the basic mechanism for the, the, the trends that we observed. So uh, pullers tend to enhance the viscosity, pushers tend to decrease the viscosity. Now, how can we be a little bit more quantitative? How can we actually come up with a mathematical model that uh, explains these trends? So I'm going to show you one model, which is uh, one that I uh, uh, worked on a, a number of years ago. Uh, we're going to consider a dilute system. <clears throat> so we're going to forget about particle-particle interactions so that we can focus on just one swimmer. So we have a single swimmer, which is uh, swimming in this shear flow. And we're going to try to calculate the, the stress or the contribution to the stress that it creates. 
Uh, so there are two parts uh, to this problem. One is that we need to figure out the orientation and distribution of that particle. Why is it aligned in the extensional axis, as, as I said, right? And so there's going to be one aspect of the model. And then the other aspect is going to be, well, once you know the orientation distribution, how do you calculate the stress? So the orientation distribution is uh, captured by this equation here, which is a Fokker Planck or a Smochowski equation for this variable psi, which describes the precis precisely the orientation distribution. And the, the variable p here is a unit vector that tells you about the, the direction of the major axis of the particle. So this uh, distribution psi of p satisfies a conservation equation uh, where the rate of change of psi is balanced by a number of, of fluxes. So this first term, which looks like uh, the divergence of the flux, uh, comes from the shear flow. There's going to be an angular velocity p dot uh, that arises due to the shear flow, which for a slender particle can be captured uh, using what's known as Jeffrey's equation, which is a classic equation that tells you about the rotation and alignment of a, of a slender particle and shear flow, where here E and W would be the rate of strain and the vorticity tensor, so the applied flow, and beta is a shape parameter, which is approximately one for uh, slender objects. So this is alignment and rotation by the shear flow. And then on top of that, these particles are small, so they diffuse. Uh, it could be because of Brownian motion, or it could be just because of stochasticity, for example, in the swimming. And so we're going to add rotational diffusion. It essentially tends to randomize orientations. And in the case of bacteria, there's also tumbling, which takes place, which is uh, uh, sudden changes in the direction of swimming, which can be captured by this term. So essentially, so this is a conservation equation that balances the effects of the shear flow, which wants to align and rotate the particles to the randomizing effects of diffusion and tumbling. So we're going to have to solve this equation. In general, it has to be done numerically. But if we're able to solve it, then we would know the orientation distribution. Uh, so that's one piece of the, of the model. The other piece is how do we get the stress? So how do these uh, dipoles that I mentioned earlier can be, can be used to construct a stress tensor, if you like? So here's one way you can uh, get to the stress. Uh, let's first think about the flow field induced by a single one of these swimmers. So we're in the Stokes regime, low Reynolds number, hydrodynamics. So we're going to write down the Stokes equations here uh, as shown at the top. So conservation momentum and uh, continuity. And um, in the Stokes equations for a single swimmer, we're going to add this forcing term here, uh, which uh, corresponds to a force dipole. So I'm not deriving all the details here, but you can see that you have a gradient of a delta function this would come from taking the limit of two equal and opposite point forces when you bring them closer and closer together, just like you do in electrostatics, for example, for point charges. So you can easily construct this term by taking that limit. So this, these are the equations that you would want to solve to figure out the flow field due to a single dipole. Now, um, if you have a distribution of dipoles with a distribution function, which could be a function of space, orientation, and so on, what you would do is average this forcing term, or take a convolution to be more specific, with uh, the distribution function psi, uh, which here I also made it a function of space, space orientation and time. You can massage this expression a little bit, uh, take this uh, gradient outside of the derivative, outside of the integral, and rewrite this uh, entire expression as follows: as a divergence of a second-order tensor. And that second order tensor is sigma naught, which is a dipole strength, times the average of PP. And when I say average, which is what these square brackets, uh, what these angle brackets denote, that's a configurational average. So we're averaging over all orientations at that point. So this looks like the divergence of a tensor that appears in the momentum equation. So we can think of this as a stress, an additional stress that's induced by the particles. And so we're going to call this the active stress. And so again, it's the average of PP. You can remove the trace if you want. It doesn't really make any difference. Um, and um, this tensor, the average of PP, is also known as the mimetic tensor, which uh, here I'm calling D, which tells you about the alignment of the swimmers. So just to summarize, so all of these dipoles, uh, we have a distribution of dipoles. And we can, we can show here that this amounts or this induces a, stress, a new stress tensor in the momentum equation, which is known as the active stress. Um, there's another way you can get to the same result, which is a, a classic result by Batchelor in the 70s, where Batchelor calculated the average stress tensor 
in a suspension of particles. So you imagine having a volume V here that contains particles, which could be anything you want. They could be uh, drops or rigid particles or polymers. Uh, and he calculated the average stress tensor in that volume. And he showed that you can write it as a sum of a contribution, which looks like the Newtonian stress, plus a correction, which is a particle stress. And the particle stress, after doing some algebra, uh, you can show that it, it has this kind of complicated form. And it has two pieces. One here is the volume average stresslet. And I'll explain what the stresslet is in, in just a second. And then the other one is a term that involves a torque on the particle. So the stress set, the stress set is shown here. Um, this is the uh, first moment of the tractions, so force per unit area on the surface of a particle. Here, sigma is the stress, sigma dot n is the traction times x, which would be the position. So this is a symmetric first moment of the forces exerted uh, by the particle on the fluid. And so this is essentially a dipole, symmetric force dipole. Now the anti-symmetric part gives you a torque. So if the particle was not torque free, if there was an external torque applied, then you could also have a contribution coming from the torque. So what this calculation shows that the, the particle stress, you can think of it as an average stresslet on the particles, where the stresslet is the symmetric force uh, dipole. So we can use this. So let's come back to our uh, active suspension of, of E. coli. So we're going to calculate the total stress as the Newtonian stress plus the particle extra stress. And the particle extra stress, as I said, is going to be this average of the stresslet, where here S is a stresslet on a single particle. Now, if you have a, a particle in a shear flow, there's going to be several contributions to the stresslet. One comes from the external flow. Um, this is the term that I was mentioning earlier for a passive rod. If you have a passive rod, the, the flow wants to stretch it, but it resists. And so there's a stresslet that's induced as a result of this uh, inextensibility. There's also a stress that, that comes from Brownian rotations. This is uh, something that's known from, uh, from, again, the suspension of rods. And then there is a dipole due to swimming, which is the one that we discussed earlier, which comes from the thrust that balances the drag on the, on the cell body. So these are uh, the expressions that you obtain in the case of a rod-like swimmer. And you can derive them, for example, using slender body theory, uh, going back to some classic papers by Hinch and Neal in the case of passive rods. So this is our description of the total particle stress. And now we can calculate this in a shear flow. Um, I'm going to skip some of the details here, but you can uh, non-dimensionalize the equations and figure out the components of these tensors that you need to define a particle viscosity, which is shown here. And you can also calculate the first and second normal stress differences if you're interested in these quantities. And these all involve moments of the orientations of the swimmer uh, with coefficients that uh, depend on the rotational diffusivity, uh, shear stress, and uh, shear rate, rather, and, um, and dipole strength. So let's look at some results. Um, so um, just as a reminder, these uh, angle brackets here, these are configurational averages. So if we want to calculate these averages, we need to calculate the orientation distribution by solving the Fokker-Planck equation. And this is what the orientation distribution looks like uh, for different shear rates. Uh, so it, peaks slightly above the flow direction, which corresponds to the uh, orientation that I was showing earlier in the cartoons. And uh, the larger the shear rate, the more aligned the suspension is along the, the flow direction. So you, now that we have these orientation distributions, we can calculate the moments and calculate the viscosity. And this is what our model predicts. <clears throat> so um, I'm, let's focus on the first plot here that shows the viscosity as a function of shear rate in suspensions of passive rods, pushers, and pullers. So for passive rods, you have a viscosity which is above zero. This is, I should say, the particle viscosity. So that's the amount above uh, the solvent viscosity. In the case of passive rods, you have a, a, a positive viscosity, which shear thins as you increase the shear rate. And that's because as the shear rate increases, the particles align more and more with the flow axis. And this is a classic behavior that's been known for about uh, 50 years since the 70s. Now, if you look at a suspension of pullers, such as chlamydomonas, you have essentially the same kind of behavior, but you have an enhancement of the viscosity at low shear rates. So the viscosity is larger because the particles are able to swim. And this comes from this additional dipole here, which again, is, as I explained earlier, tends to resist the flow. Now, in the case of pushers, uh, where the, the dipole is of the opposite sign, the swimming dipole is of the opposite sign, we have a, a trend which is quite different and which is similar to what I was describing earlier on the experiments, which is that we have a decrease in viscosity at low shear rates. In fact, 
uh, the, the viscosity becomes less than the solvent, and as indicated by this negative value, then it shear thickens and then shear thins again. So this is the same kind of trend that we were seeing in the experimental uh, data earlier. Um, I'm going to skip the discussion of the first normal stress differences, other than to mention that the sign of these differences is opposite in the case of pushers compared to uh, pullers and passive rods. You can actually derive an analytical expression for this low shear plateau when gamma dot goes to zero, and this is what the viscosity looks like. So it's one, that's the solvent, plus this correction, uh, which has two contributions. One is passive and one is active. And for a negative dipole, which is a case of a pusher, you can see how this active contribution can lead to a decrease in the viscosity. Um, all right, so there's quite a bit of work beyond this that's been done. I'm just going to mention briefly a, a couple of aspects. One is that you can look at unsteady uh, rheology, and there are some interesting trends that happen, as you can see in this plot here on the left, where you have stress overshoots and stress undershoots. And these come from the fact that there's a finite relaxation time for the orientations in the, in the system as you turn on or off the, uh, the shearing. And I'm going to skip through all of this and mention briefly what happens in, uh, in uh, channel flows. Um, so you can also think about the rheology in a Poiseuille flow. Um, and uh, in channel flows, particles tend to accumulate at boundaries, as you can see here. Uh, and so if you apply now a pressure-driven flow, they're going to align in the direction as shown here, where again, the dipoles that they exert is going to tend to enhance the applied flow. And so we also have, have a, a paper that developed a theory for this, uh, which shows similar trends. So you find again that the relative viscosity is less than one at low flow strengths, increases and then decreases. And uh, at high densities, you find that the viscosity can reach zero, which is very similar to what was seen in the experiments by Lopez. So there's a transition to an apparent uh, superfluidity where the system essentially doesn't require any external stress in order to, to drive itself. And I'm gonna, I'm realizing I'm almost out of time. So I'm gonna conclude by uh, saying that this is related to uh, spontaneous flows in these systems. And for example, here's a one paper um, that looked at this a few years ago. Um, the experiments were done by Hugo Violon and then simulations by, by Kela, where they looked at uh, uh, bacteria in a racetrack. And what they found is that under the right conditions, you can get a spontaneous flow, um, either clockwise or counterclockwise. And uh, this spontaneous flow that you're seeing here is directly related to this transition to superfluidity. Um, at a sufficient concentration, there's no resistance to flowing anymore. And so the system can spontaneously start, uh, start displaying these, uh, these large scale flows. So um, we've done some modeling on this. Uh, I'm going to refer to my uh, annual review paper if you want to read the details. So I'm going to stop here in the interest of time. Here are just a few references that I can recommend if you want to read more about, uh, about this topic. Thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take uh, questions on this. Great. Uh, thank you, David, for this wonderful tutorial. Uh, we do have uh, questions. The first from uh, Oleg Lavrendovich. Uh, Passive pneumatics often tumble. Uh, what would be the result of adding activity to a tumbling pneumatic? Um, so I think that's, um, if I understand the question correctly, I mean, I think that's essentially what we're doing, right? Our, our, uh, our model for these active pneumatics does include tumbling, right? Which comes from the, what well, there could be tumbling due, due to the bacteria tumbling, or there could be tumbling due to the external flow. If you look, if you track the, the orientation of one of the particles in shear flow, it's going to tumble uh, quasi-periodically. So I hope I'm answering the, the question. So our, our model is essentially the, a model for a passive pneumatic in which we have this additional activity. Right. Yeah, may I clarify the question? Yes, of course. So, so you, you, you said that, for example, the passive um, rod would align uh, it's a flow alignment, and then you demonstrated the numerical simulations that show alignment. But uh, what I mean on the tumbling is that very often everything realigns along the vorticity axis, and um, I, I didn't see that in the simulations. Along the vorticity axis. Right, right. Um, so I wonder if this has to do with uh, interactions, I guess. I mean, our theories for dilute uh, dilute suspension, right? And in the case of a dilute suspension, um, you do not get uh, alignment along the vorticity axis, as far as I know, right? So the, the alignment is really close to the flow axis. Okay, that's what I meant by 
passive pneumatic. So often I see, I see, I see. We haven't. I mean, we've, this we've, is not the bacterial problem, of course. Right. So I mean, we've we've done a few simulations where we've added you know elastic um, uh, pneumatic elasticity, I guess, but we haven't really explored that that very well. That's not the regime that's relevant for bacteria. That's right. Thank you. There is a question from Sriram Ramaswani. Um, uh, hi, David. Properly speaking, the Brownian stress for rods is proportional to the molecular field conjugate to the pneumatic tensor. Uh, so for the equilibrium case, if the mean pneumatic tensor is not zero, the deviatoric stress is still zero, right? So even if the mean pneumatic tensor is non-zero, the deviatoric stress is still zero. That's, that's correct, right. I think, yes. Yeah, no, sorry, I just raised, I raised that nerdy question just to point out that when you write the expression for the, in the, in the dilute theory, you write next to the, the Brownian and the other contributions, both are simply proportional to the pneumatic tensor. Right. Uh, the unwary reader could get the impression that having a non-zero pneumatic tensor immediately implies having a non-zero deviatoric stress. That's true only in the active case. An equilibrium system can have a non-zero pneumatic tensor in equilibrium and its deviatoric stress will be zero. So, sorry, this is a pointy headed point. I see, I see. Okay, I see what you mean. Yes. Okay. Uh, and we have one Thanks. more question by G. Lin. Uh, can the dilute theory explain why the viscosity decreases with the cell density observed in experiments? Yes, absolutely. So, actually, I have, I'm on the right side slide right here, right? So, in the dilute theory, uh, the particle stress depends linearly on the density. Right. Uh, so if the if this is negative, you increase the density. You're just the the the, the uh, correction to the Newtonian to the solvent viscosity is going to uh, increase or decrease linearly with density, and that's what we were seeing in that last plot that I showed uh, over here, for example, right, where we uh, we varied the density and we do find that the low shear plateau decreases uh, with density until it reaches approximately zero. Of course, in the experiments, you might reach some regimes where particle-particle interactions start to matter. That's obviously not uh, accounted for by our model. So the interest of time, uh, we will switch to the talk now. Thanks, everyone. Uh, David will stay afterwards for more questions. The talks will be posted uh, in the YouTube channel afterwards. So... Um,